All right, guys, I'm super stoked to be here, guys, man. We just had camp. For those of you who missed out, man, it was awesome. If you're at camp, just give a big scream right now. Okay, okay. okay. All right, all right. And the crowd went hush. And it went hush. And the crowd went hush. And the crowd died down. And the volume went down in the car. No, okay. Guys, it was a fun camp. We had a great time. I hope you guys had a great time. But for those of you guys who didn't go, there's still hope for you. We do have spring camp. We are going to start planning it soon. And so, guys, there are other camps. Just because you missed the summer one doesn't mean you can't get plugged in. But, man, did we have fun. It was a great camp. We went through the book of Ephesians. If you weren't there, man, you missed out. But, like I said, more camps to become in the future. Raul, you're good. Everyone give it up for Raul. We love you, Raul. All right. Well, this is the time where I need you guys to all stand up. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's coming. I want you to throw your hands up in the air. I want you to say spirit fingers. I want you to say jazz hands. All right, now give the person on your right a massage. Person on your right, give him a little back massage. Make sure you get the kinks out. Ask him if they ate some beans today. And if you did, say yes. All right, now throw your hands up in the air. Say spirit fingers. Say jazz hands. All right, now give the person on your left a little back massage. Work in the love. Hey, that one guy that brought oil, I don't know where he got the oil from. That's a little weird. No, I'm just kidding. Didn't happen. All right. You guys can have a seat. You guys can have a seat. Man, your summer is running out. Just very soon coming up here, we are going to be in school again. Before I get started, guys, in today's message, if you had missed out this Thursday, this Thursday we went to Sky Zone and we jumped around. Jump, jump, jump. No, okay, no. But we were jumping like crazy. It was fun. He's got, hey, Wolfie's got his Sky Zone socks on, rocking it. I got some packed away. But this next Thursday, guys, this Thursday, there is nothing happening this Thursday because we are going to be on vacation. But we still have youth group. Because we're coming back all the way from where we go just so we can be here for Friday night. So be here next Friday. We're going to be here. And the following Thursdays, after that Thursday, we will start back up terrific or crazy, whatever we call them, Thursdays. But we will have them. Really? Really? I make them up. I flip a coin every year. I'm like, what starts with a T and add it with Thursday or Tuesday? Terrific. Turbulent. Give me another T. Come on, guys. Thrilling. We, <laughs> the, the thing is, is that it's on Thursday. All right. It's on Thursday. Well, guys, we're going to start, but before we do, I'd like to pray and, and get our hearts right and get our minds right, because Lord knows there's a bunch of distractions that can kind of go on, and Twister was fun, and the worship was fun, but guys, this is a time where God can really speak to our hearts if we let him. So let's just give some reverence to God, and we're going to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray to you right now, and I just pray that, that we would be able to just focus on you through this message. And, and God, I know sometimes it's really difficult going into the Word because the world can be so distracting. There's just so much going on, and if we don't filter some of the stuff out, God, we'll miss out on what you have for us. God, I pray that, that wouldn't be so, that we would actually hold on to what it is that you have for our lives. I lift all this up to you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Today's message is called Logos and Slogans. Logos and Slogans. And it's crazy because each and every one of you came here wearing some kind of slogan, maybe on your shirt. Maybe if you go to the back of your tag, there's a brand. But each and every day, guys, we are consumed by brands. We are consumed by just the stuff that we buy. Raise your hand if you like Starbucks. Raise your hand and keep raising it if you think Starbucks is the best coffee. All right? See, so everyone's got an opinion, but that usually comes by a brand. Here, you guys can put your hands down. Raise your hand if you like to wear Nike. Raise your hand if you think Reebok is better than Nike. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. I think Reebok's actually doing a pretty good job, but, you know, I'm more of a Nike guy myself. All right, raise your hand if you like Adidas. See? I want you to look around because we have all these different opinions going on, but there's brands every day being told to you what it is that you have to like and what it is you have to not like. 
That is the goal of a brand. That is the goal of a logo. That's the goal of a slogan. They grab the attention of the consumer. Who is the consumer? You guys. Every time you buy a Big Mac, you are a consumer of McDonald's. Every time you buy a Whopper, you are a consumer of Burger King. Guys, we are buying into this stuff 24-7. I kind of want to do this just to kind of give you a breakdown of how powerful slogans can be in our lives. But here we have, oh, and if you have a cell phone, it's time to turn it off. It's okay. You get a break. I'll give you a chance. If you have a, a cell phone or your Pokemon hunting during the message, this would be the time to, like, turn off. You'll save battery so you can Pokemon hunt after. But, you know, let's, let's like, go after, you know, the Pokemon God has for us, which is Jesus. But, you know, it's okay. I'll set up a lure later. Uh, anyways, so we're going back to the message here. And we see here that there's all these different slogans in the world. And I kind of wanted to rank them like 1 through 10. We'll start at 10. If you guys know this one, I want you to say it out loud. You're in good hands. Allstate. All yeah, we all love Allstate. All right. Number 9. Melts in your mouth, not in your hands. Oh, we got it. Eminem. Some of you guys were like short on it. You're like, man. Uh, uh, uh. All right. Don't leave home without it. Oh, man. Don't leave home without no, no one. No one's got this. MasterCard. MasterCard. Don't leave home without it. All right, all right. Where's the beef? Nope. What? Nope, it's not Arby's. What? It's Wendy's. He's right. That's Wendy's slogan. Where's the beef? All right. Let's see if anyone gets this one. I'll actually give them a dollar. But you can't use your phone. You can't use your phone. So phones, if I see a phone out, this won't work. All right. Got milk. Anyone? Anyone got milk? Do you know the answer? Wait, Ruben, do you know? They do come from cows, but the slogan, huh? Nope. The slogan came from the California Milk Processing Board. Yeah. How could you not know that? They made up Got Milk. California, guys. Who would have thought? Thank you, California, to getting us. Also, the ultimate driving machine. Come on, you guys got to know this one. BMW, he knows, he knows. Number four, because you're worth it. Girls, come on. Girls. Girls, this is a girl product. Because you're worth it. I can't hear. Guys, guys, calm down. L'Oreal. L'Oreal, because you're worth it. All right, all right, all right, here's one, here's one. We're in right now number three. Think different. <laughs> Marcos, he's so funny. He's, he, he's too old to be here. <laughs> huh? Think different. Apple, yes, Mac. All right. Just do it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, all right, all right. The last one. This is actually the longest standing slogan in the world. Actually, in the United States. I don't know about in the world. But in the United States, a diamond is forever. It's not K. What? What? Girls, come on. You got to know your diamonds. Huh? Jared? No, it's not Jared's. Huh? No. It's not Hollister. <laughs> no, it's not. Guys, it's, it's De Beers. De Beers. Yeah. Dude, it's one of the oldest diamond companies. They've been around for a while. Anyways, guys, come down, come down. This is crazy because all of us, we know these slogans, and we're kind of driven by them. And if they're really good slogans, we buy into it 100%, and it does affect the way that we consume. 
man, if I see a Klondike commercial and they do it really well, I'm like, yo, man, I want a Klondike bar. And, and it really does. I'd be watching Taco Bell at home, and all of a sudden, Taco Bell just seems even better when I watch the commercial. And I have Taco Bell in my hand, but I want to go back through the drive-thru and get more Taco Bell. Because that's how good they are. Right? Think outside the box. He, he knows. He knows. Dude, they were the box, the bun. Dude, I'll eat the whole thing. It's Taco Bell. But my whole point is, guys, is that the consumer is trying to make us believe something that's not true, that, that's not happening in our own lives. I want to think like L'Oreal. It says, you know, for L'Oreal, it is this. We have it. Because you're worth it. And the idea is that, man, if you're not wearing L'Oreal, you're not really worth it. And so we, you can kind of have this devaluing system from looking at these slogans where you're like, man, I am less because I don't have this or that. I, I'm not really up here at this status because I'm not wearing this brand or this thing. And it starts to kind of consume us, the consumer. We start being like, man, I, I'm empty without it. I, I, I don't know what I'm going to do if I don't get it. And ladies, man, even with a diamond, it's like one thing to get a diamond from a pawn shop. It's another thing to get a diamond from K. You know? Every kiss is K. I forget how it goes. I was... Mike's, there we go. Here we go, here we go. Every kiss begins with K. Yeah, she knows, she knows. But you guys can begin to see how, how this can affect your desires and even affect what you need versus what you want. And a lot of times we kind of don't know this, that this is happening to us. But some of the things that we really want, we really don't what? We don't need. We don't need it. How many shoes... Do you guys have any? Let's start at five. Raise your hand if you have five pairs of shoes. All right. Raise your hand if you have four pairs of shoes. Raise your hand if you have three, over three pairs of shoes. Over three pairs of shoes. Raise your hand if you have over two pairs of shoes. Raise your, raise your hand if you don't own shoes. Do it. Lies, lies. You're wearing shoes right now. Dude. 10, 10 pairs of shoes, 20 pairs of shoes, okay, 100 pairs of shoes, all right, here we go, here we go, so we can start to see even from the little things, man, we can kind of just begin to accumulate and accumulate and accumulate, and really in the end of the day, it just takes up space, that thing that we thought we had to have is only there until we get the next thing. We see this all the time with Apple. Everyone waits in line to get the new iPhone. And then all of a sudden, man, I love my iPhone 6S Plus. And all of a sudden, next week, the 7. And everyone is there, and they're waiting for the 7 because now it was good, but now there's the new thing, the fresh thing. And all of a sudden, what you have is devalued. What you have isn't good enough. I want to talk to you about a lady who thought she wasn't good enough. And I want you guys to open up to John chapter 4. And she had kind of bought into this idea of her identity and who she was. Because that's what the branding is. And that's what the, all the stuff is kind of wrapped around is your identity. That you're building up your identity in it. So John chapter 4. John chapter 4. So we see here it says Jesus and the Samaritan woman. A little kind of backdrop on Samaritans. For those of you who've already heard me review Samaritans before, but a Samaritan, guys, is like a half-breed Jew. They've got mixed blood. They're not pure Jew in their life. They're not pure Jew in their family line. And so if you look at their family line, the Jews are very, very meticulous about being within one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And if you're a Samaritan somewhere, you're a mutt. Really, that's what you are in, in mentality. And so the Samaritan is also you got to understand that when the Babylonian captivity happened, they took the highest of the high. When Nebuchadnezzar came into Israel and he kid kidnapped and ransacked all of Israel, he took the best of the best and he shipped them off to Babylon. But I want you to know something that was really interesting is that he left the lowest of the low. He left the Samaritans. So the Samaritans didn't actually get ca ca taken captive. They were left there in Israel to worship. And they had to kind of figure out their own process and their own temple and everything without the actual families being there. 
because the Babylonian captivity had really divided everybody else. So if you kind of have this understanding, you can kind of understand where Jesus is coming into the mix, where he is a pure Jew. He would have been considered, even in his day and time, a rabbi, and he would have had the lineage of a king. And they would have known this through public record, through having the lineage of David. And you'll see that if you look into the triumphal entry of Jesus. They'll be calling him Hosanna, Hosanna. And so you'll see there in that. But right now we're talking about John chapter 4. And it says here, when Jesus knew that the Pharisees heard he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing but his disciples were, he left Judea and went again to Galilee. Galilee is like his hometown. That's where he's from. This is his place. He loves Galilee. So he's left Judea. He went again to Galilee, and he had to travel through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sinchar, near the property that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, it's really good, dude, if you just turn it off. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you there. I'm sorry. I apologize. It went off twice. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. We'd love to see you next week, bro. So we see here in verse 6, it says, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, worn out of his journey, sat down at the well, it was about 6 in the evening. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and she said this, Give me a drink. And Jesus said to her, For his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Now, this would never happen. The idea of her going out to get water and her having a reputation as a Samaritan, they don't interact. There is a, a strict standard that says that, man, Samaritans walk on one side of the sidewalk, and over here, Jews walk on another. Completely divided. Does it kind of remind you of a day and age today? On how the whole country is now divided on, on all these different issues, on racial things? It's happening, guys. And division is not something that's new. It's something that's been going on for a long period of time. Long and long and long it's been going on. And so we look here in scriptures there's this dividing, there's this division going on between the Samaritan and between the Jews. But Jesus sees it as an opportunity to say that, that person is valuable. That, that I find value in that person, so I'm going to go out of my way to talk to him. So we see here, she asked him, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. It says here, Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God, and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him, and he would give you living water. It's kind of crazy because when we go to church, sometimes we're experiencing, we're like, man, I'm going to experience religion. I'm showing up here because I, I, it's traditional, it's what I'm supposed to do, but man, I'm not really going here because I'm expecting anything from God. I'm not really going here because I think I'm going to experience God in any fashion, in any way, in any shape or form. I'm just going to church. And for a lot of people, that's what church is. It's something that they show up on Sunday morning, they show up on Friday to youth group, it's a getty, it's a hangout, but it's nothing about a relationship. But Jesus says, man, he's like, you came here to drink water today. What if I could give you something that you've never experienced before? And that's kind of like the lure of the brand, the lure of the slogan. And Jesus' slogan is so interesting because it's living water. Living water. Because we kind of drink and we get thirsty again. The moment we go to the well of life, all of a sudden we always pull it up and we're there and we drink. And all of a sudden, once again, we're coming back to the same well. We're doing the same thing, expecting different results. And we're going to the same well. And life is happening over and over again. But there's no real change. There's no real transformation. And Jesus is trying to prod the Samaritan woman's heart and her attitude. Say, man, have you had enough? See, God will actually let you go sometimes. He'll let you experience everything the world has to offer just so that you understand that it's never going to it's never going to fulfill you as good as him. It's never going to sustain you as good as him. And so we see here in the scriptures, if you asked, you would know that I have living water. But she's not there to experience God, she's just there to get her water. And, and that's a lot of us going to church. We're not there to hear a message. We're there to hang out with a friend. We're there to do something else. But, man, could you imagine if you had a different heart showing up to church, what God could do and how he could pour into your life actual living water? So we see here it says in verse 11, Sir, said the woman, 
You don't even have a bucket. And the well is deep. So where do you get this living water? Man, she's being sarcastic. She's, she's prodding him. She's poking back at him. Because she's like, man, I'm hot. I've had a long day. I don't want to be messed with. You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. What's the joke? What are you going to say? And she probably has all these expectations of how this Jew is going to treat her. And she probably has an enormous chip on her shoulder. But guess what? It's not how Jesus responds. So we see here, sir, said the woman, you don't even have a bucket and the well is deep. So where do you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? Not even knowing that the person that she's talking to is from a descendant of Jacob. From a descendant. And so he literally is Jesus the Christ. And so we see, you aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus says this in verse 13. Everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. Get thirsty again. The repetition of life. If you keep trying the same things in life, man, you're going to start to realize there's a futility in it. That, man, Solomon himself, the wisest guy in the world, said, vanity, vanity, it's all vanity. It means useless pretty much. That you can work and work and work and in one day lose it all. And, and this is kind of life. And so life has to be more than your work. More, life has to be more than your relationships with maybe your boyfriend or your girlfriend, your mom or your dad. Life has to be more than that. And God is saying, life has to be about me. And he's trying to, to prod her heart and to get her to focus beyond herself and to show what happens when he step into the eternal, when you step into Jesus. So Jesus said, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. And, and he emphasizes ever. And so the slogan. Here is the logo. Here is the thing that is shooting out. She has heard all these brands, man. They probably got this nice fine linen purple stuff that they buy over there. And they're like, man, I like that. They didn't really have Nike back then, but they had sundials. They didn't have watches. And so you have to kind of imagine they're their brands. They're the things that, that she could go to and buy. But she had never heard this before. This was all fresh. And that's what Jesus does. He always gives a fresh word. He always gives a new perspective. He always shows you what it is that is best than what's just okay. And so we see here, sir, the woman said to him, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and come here to draw water. I just skipped a part, so I want to read it. It says, in fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up within him for eternal life. And in verse 15, it says, sir, the woman said to him, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and come here to draw water. And verse 16, he says, go call your husband, he told her, and come back here. And she says, kind of getting caught sideways in verse 17, I don't have a husband, she answered. Man, boy, do we lie well. We get so good at lying that even we begin to believe it. We start to define things uh, and what is sex and what is this and what is that. But right here, look at this. She's like, man, I, I don't have a husband. I, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know where you're getting at. And it says here, I don't have a husband, she answered. You have correctly answered, I don't have a husband, Jesus said. For you have had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. You know what Jesus does is that. He goes straight to the heart. When you pray, you got to understand that God already knows how you're going to respond. I know that's kind of crazy, but he also gives you an opportunity through grace to respond. And so when you look at that and you're the person that's at the well and you come there to Jesus, allow Jesus to, yes, point out your faults, but then take your faults and say, do I want this or do I want living water? Do I want to hold on to my pride and me being right? Or do I want everything that God has for me and more? Because Jesus is the most valuable thing in my life. Man, it begins to really transform and change your life and your heart and your own Christian relationship when you start to see life through the lens of Christ. And you start to see stuff the way Jesus sees it. And so Jesus cuts right through and he says, man, you got five baby daddies. You got five. And he says here in verse 19, sir, the woman replied, I see that you are a prophet. Because, man, a prophet can't lie. Prophets 
I see that you're a prophet. And little did she know she was talking to God in the flesh. Jesus is God in the flesh. And so we see here in verse 20, our fathers worshipped on this mountain. Yet you Jews say that the place of worship is in Jerusalem. This is a problem because remember, they went to the Babylonian captivity. And they were stuck there to worship on that mountain. They're by themselves. And so we see here in verse 21, Jesus told her, believe me, woman. An hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. Because salvation is from the Jews. But man, God didn't just live, leave it there. He didn't just say, oh man, it's just for the Jews. Now get away, Samaritan. And we kind of have to reflect this in our own life. That man, when someone comes up to us with different ideals, different opinions, a different perspective, we have to learn to speak the truth with love. And we have to learn how to do that. So that, that we can really point out the sin, but not point out the sinner. And they know they're sinning. But sometimes it's like better to talk about that than to talk about hell as your first conversation. I have no room for you. I can't talk to you. You're ignorant. You're ignorant. You're not going to get anywhere with that. But man, when you present the love of Christ, the love of Christ can do far more than your arguments ever can. And, and so you start to see here in the scriptures, it says, and I just lost my spot. I have it here. I'm just going to go to 21. Jesus told her, believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and is now here. I want you guys to say now here. Jesus Christ has offered salvation for you today, right now. The devil wants you to put it off and say, man, that's not for me. I can do it any time I want. And maybe that's true to a point. But it says in the scriptures, it's appointed once for a man or a woman to die, and after that, the judgment. Each and every one of you has an expiration date on your life. Each and every one of you is going to die. That's inevitable. None of us are going to get out alive. And so when you think like that, in terms like that, unless you have a relationship with Jesus, man, you live for everything and you get nothing. And Jesus wants to give you everything through a relationship in him. And he does the same thing to this woman at the well. He says, but an hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit. And in yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. God's spirit has to be inside of you for you to recognize him. Jesus says, man, we can't go to the Father but by him. When his spirit prods you, man, don't ignore him. When Jesus says and he knocks at your heart and says, hey, guess what? You're following all these other brands, but you're not following me. What's up? Those things aren't going to save you. I'm the one that's going to save you. And that's why Jesus is so passionate, and that's why Jesus will, will literally call us out in our junk and in our sin because he doesn't want us to stay there. He doesn't want us to stay the same. So he says here, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And I love this because he says, I am he. I am the Messiah that you have been waiting for. I am that person that you talk about worshiping. I am that person that you have been waiting for. Wake up. And a lot of us, man, if that doesn't move you, man, you got to start looking inside and saying, am I really listening to God? Am I really working on that relationship? Am I really allowing God to point out the faults in my life so that I can get closer to him? And so we see here, he jumps right in. He says in verse 27, just then his disciples arrived, and they were amazed that he was talking with a woman. Man, how could he be doing that? Yet no one said, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Man, they kind of figured it out by now not to question Jesus in that way. Because Jesus had already rebuked them and corrected them in certain times. But it doesn't mean they didn't try to get fresh every now and then. So it says in verse 28, Then the woman left her water jar, went into town, and told the men, Come see 
a man who told me everything I ever did, could this be the Messiah? They left the town and made their way to him. In the meantime, the disciples kept urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said, I have food to eat that you don't know about. The disciples said to one another, could someone have brought him something to eat? They're so concrete, right? They're like, man, he, he's not talking about food. He's talking about people. He's talking about kingdom. And we, we have to get passionate about it. Like the Samaritan woman. Because she gets up and she goes. And you're going to get to see kind of what happens in a second here. But it says, don't you say, it says, Jesus then told him, don't you say, there are still four more months, then comes the harvest. Listen, what I'm telling you, open your eyes and look at the fields, for they are ready for harvest. The reaper is already receiving pay and gathering fruit for it. So the power, reap what you didn't labor for. Others have labored. And you have benefited from their labor. He's talking about the prophets. He's talking about all the people that came before you. He's talking about all the people who are waiting for the expectation of the Messiah. And now the Messiah has come. And now the Messiah has died on the cross. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He paid on the cross the payment of wrath that you deserve. You guys got to understand that apart from Christ, you would be condemned to hell. Because apart from Christ, we deserve that. Because we've sinned once. If you even sin once, you've already fallen short of God's glory. You've already fallen short of the expectation that God has for you. And so, man, it's so important to know what it is that Jesus did for you. And how, how that we have to be ready. You're going to see this idea of harvest all the way throughout the New Testament. And that's kind of God's slogan. Saying that, man, there's this harvest, and he needs workers. A lot of you just came back from camp. And you guys kind of get like this. You start, and man, camp is awesome. Camp feels great. Man, you're doing your quiet time. Monday through Friday, you're waking up. Things are good. And you can't really fight with mom and dad because mom and dad are away. And then you come back. You come back to the world. You come back to everything that's going on. And all of a sudden, when you come back down into the valley of life, Things start to get difficult. And a lot of times it's because we stop having fellowship with him. I mean, you find you during quiet time hour and be like, you know, just imagine Mrs. Myers pop out at your house at 9 o'clock in the morning. Quiet time. That'd be crazy, right? But you're like, it would work. You have this thing called the Holy Spirit that gives you the ability to have self-discipline, to have self-control. And God has allowed that and granted that into your life through the fruits of the Spirit. And he wants you to use those to draw near to him so that he can produce in you fruit, abundant fruit. So that when he does talk about this idea of a harvest, you're not looking at yourself and saying, man, I am hopeless. I'm doing nothing. But you know that the living water is pouring in you and through you. And people are seeing that and feeling that because you are close and in step with Christ. It makes a difference. It made a difference in the Samaritan woman because he says, Now many Samaritans, in verse 39, Now many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of what the woman said when she testified. And get this, he told me everything I ever did. Everything I ever did. Could you imagine that right now, how comfortable you would feel that if I selected one of you and I said, God, I want you to unveil everything that person ever did so that the rest of the audience can see. Would you guys feel comfortable with that? But man, the Samaritan woman was like right there and God literally showed her everything she ever did. And she realized how much in need of a savior she really was. You guys know what the biggest fool of our life is? The thing that tricks us more than anything else? It's our pride. Our pride can get so puffed up in each and every one of us that we can really believe that we don't need Jesus. That we don't need a Savior. That we don't need forgiveness. That we got it all figured out. But you know what Jesus does? He looks at you at the well and he sees you doing circles. And he says, still thirsty, right? You still need me, right? 
And Jesus will continue to prod you and watch you do the crazy cycle over and over and over again until you learn to reach out to him and allow him to touch your life. And when that happens, man, that's when true transformation, true discipleship, true surrender really begins to take on shape and form in your life. Because you're not just talking about it. You're actually being about it. It's, it's something that's in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That, man, you were hopeless before. You were coming to the well day in and day out. But now you have hope because in him you have found grace. And his grace has transformed you from the person that you were to the person that you now are becoming through and in him. Jesus transforms you. Jesus comes into your life and makes you into the person that you need to be. So we see here, man, immediately something that's characteristic about the Samaritan woman is that she went out and she told people about Jesus. Guys, don't tell me you said you accepted Jesus, but you don't want to talk to other people about Jesus. Because that's not the Jesus I know. When you really say you're a Christian and you really take on Christ and you really take on a slogan, I believe in Jesus, and you buy into that and you say, I own that in my life, you are literally saying, I have died to the rights of myself. If you have died, how many rights does a dead man have? None. You think that they, they have any rights? Oh, no, I don't want to be presented that way in a coffin. They can't say anything because they're dead. And when you came to Christ, you said that you died to your sin, that you died to your flesh, that you died to this body. And you're saying, Jesus, I want you to be in charge of my life. That is ownership. That is lordship. That is surrender. And some of you have said, I believe, but you have yet to surrender in your life. And that is hypocrisy. You've got to surrender. You got to get to the point like the woman at the well that says, yes, I may have done all these sinful things. I may have messed up in really, really big ways, but I am sick and tired of messing up. And I'm thirsty all the time. You know the thing about sinning is, man, even though they have a smile, man, those people are some of the most depressed people all the time. When you keep sinning, when I sin for like a weekend, like three days straight, I'm the most depressed person because I have the Holy Spirit in my heart. And it convicts me. It's like, Mike, get right with God. Mike, get right with God. And it keeps continuing in a cycle in my mind. And it eats away at me. So I know for a fact that the person doesn't have Christ in their heart or in their life. You've got to imagine the loads of depression upon that person's shoulders. And loads of depression they were never designed to carry. Because Jesus is already carrying it on the cross. He's already paid for it on the cross. But maybe no one's ever told him. And what I love about the Samaritan woman is she didn't just get her life changed by Christ. She's changing other people's lives for Christ. See, man, if you accept Jesus, there has to be a transformation that says, I want to be a witness for Jesus. That I, I got to testify. That I got to talk about it. That, that I can't just keep my mouth shut because Jesus did these immeasurable great things in my life. Now I got to do something for him. It's not all about me. It's not all about my paycheck. It's not all about what I'm going to earn. It's not all about what I'm going to wear. It's about Jesus. It's about him. And the Samaritan said here, it says, man, an entire city in this area, people came to know the Lord. Therefore, when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of what he said. And you got to go in there knowing that, man, you're not the one that pushes belief, but that God is the one that says, do you want to believe in me? Do you want to place your faith and your confidence and your trust in me? It worked for the Samaritan woman because she was all in. If you are getting frustrated in your Christian walk, it's usually because you're not surrendered. A surrendered person immediately becomes fruitful. It, it just happens because you have a courage about you. You're not timid. You're not a coward. You walk out because you know that you have God behind you, backing you. Every single time in scriptures when the Holy Spirit fills an individual, that person is no longer the same. Moses said, I can't speak. I can't do this. And God used him in what? Immeasurable ways. 
I have so many people like Gideon in the Bible that were completely timid, shy. They, they, they had no idea how to handle fear. But then mo- immediately when the Holy Spirit enters their life, what begins to happen? He becomes courageous. He steps out because he knows that it's not him accomplishing what he's accomplishing. It's God accomplishing it through his word. Guys, we're just vessels. God is using us through his message. And you have to ask yourself, do you want to be used by him? As the band comes up right now and as we finish, I I want you guys to really be working on this this week. To ask yourself the question, am I really following Christ? Am I really surrendered to Christ? Or do I just go through the motions? Are you thirsty? And are you tired of being thirsty? I'm not talking about getting some water after a game. I'm not talking about, man, I I need some Gatorade because I played basketball. I'm not talking, I'm talking about a thirst for God. A thirst for real meaning. Not the emptiness that says when you go to put your your head on your pillow at at night, that says, man, I, I don't like who I am. I don't like my life right now. And a lot of times that's because you don't have God pouring into your life living water. Living water. Man, a lot of us, it says that we're dead in our transgressions and sins. Man, we're dead before we come to know God. And when we come to know God, God gives us life. And he doesn't just give us any ordinary life. He gives it to us abundantly. Abundantly so that what? We can sit on it. So that we can share it. So that we can tell others about Christ. So that we can get passionate. Guys, my goal is not that you guys would learn how to go through the motions. Because all going through the motions does, guys, is it numbs you out. When you continue to say, man, I don't want to change. 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 I'm going to put up a facade. I'm going to put up a facade. I'm going to put up a facade. All that begins to happen is people on the outside think that you're one way, but deep down inside, the only person you're fooling is yourself. Because every single time you deny the truth, you get more calloused. Every time you push the Bible away in your room and say, man, I don't don't have time for a quiet time, you get more calloused. And God's not trying to rain on your parade and make you feel depressed. He's trying to give you freedom. Because whatever you're sinning to and you can't help yourself, you're a slave to it. You're not really free. And so a lot of you today, you might be feeling down. You might be feeling like, man, I feel like I'm a slave, Mike. I feel like all I do is sin and sin and sin. I have no power. You need Jesus in your life. Right now, I want everyone to put their heads down. If you came here today and you know that you don't have a relationship with Jesus, my question is, what's keeping you? Why aren't you running to him as fast as you can, knowing that he can give you living water, knowing that he can give you eternal life, knowing that he can change your brokenness into wholeness again? Right now, if you know that you're just broken, you know that you need to be broken, this is a time to come forward. As the altar comes forward, like open and stuff, I want you guys to know that, man, the Samaritan woman, she's not perfect. She sinned a whole lot. But she was sincere when she came to Jesus and she said, I no longer want to be this person. If that's you and you know that you're struggling with some kind of sin, some kind of struggle, lay it at the foot of the altar. Lay it at Jesus' feet and say, Jesus, forgive me of this sin. I repent. If that's you and you know that you need to repent today, come forward and get your heart right with God. Eclipse. 
shapes thy glory and i realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me and oh how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us so we are his portion and he is our prize drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes and if grace is an ocean we're all sinking and heaven meets earth like a slop and a kiss and my heart turns violently inside of my chest i don't have time to maintain these regrets when i think about the way that he loves us oh how he loves us Love's like a hurricane, I am a tree Bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory And I realize just how beautiful you are And how great your affections for me Oh, he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves. And we are his portion, and he is our prize. Drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes. And if grace is an ocean we're all sinking and heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss and my heart turns violently inside of my chest i don't have time to maintain these regrets when i think about the way that he loves us oh how he loves us oh how he loves us oh how he loves he loves us oh how he loves us oh how he loves us oh how he loves us everyone could bow their heads still I want to talk to a person right now that you came here today and maybe you weren't expecting to experience God. Maybe you thought, man, like it wasn't for me, but for the first time in your life and in your heart, you feel God prodding, knocking at your door, knocking at your life. And you know that you've been maybe putting it off for a while, but today you understand that, man, Jesus paid it all for you on the cross. And you understand that, man, without him, we're dead in our sin. And that we need to be born again. And we need to have his spirit poured out into us. A spirit of living water. Right now, if you know that that's you, and you're ready. You're ready to receive Jesus in your heart. You're ready to let him in for the first time. I want you to say this prayer after me. The, the prayer is not magical. It, it's literally you talking to God. And when you say this prayer, Jesus comes into your heart. And he sets up his home inside of you. 
So if that's you and you want to, to allow Jesus to come into your life today, you're ready. You get it. Say this prayer for me. Dear Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner. And I know I have been running from you. I know that I have been living for myself. But Jesus, right now, I repent. I want to stop living for myself. And Jesus, I want to surrender to you. Lord, I want to follow you. So Jesus, please right now, forgive me of my sin. Thank you, Jesus. And Jesus, right now, please come into my heart. I want you to, to make me new. I want you to pour your Holy Spirit into me. Thank you. Jesus, I want to continue to follow you in everything that I do. And from this day forward, Jesus, I will be your disciple. I will talk passionately about you to anyone and everyone I come into contact with. I'm going to do my best, Jesus, to follow you in everything that I do. I lift all this up to you, Jesus. And in your name I pray. Right now, if everyone can keep their heads bowed, if you made that decision for the first time, it's tough, and I know it's tough, but you know what? It's the greatest decision that you will ever make your entire life. Because this is a decision that secures eternal life in a relationship with Jesus that is forever. So right now, if you made that decision without anyone else looking around, everyone's got their head bowed, I just want you to, to just raise your hand up. Lift your hand up right now. Amen. going to close right now and I want you guys to know that man you don't have to go on living life the way that you've been that if you come back from camp and you're already slipping up you're already messing up and you can do the right things through Christ but you can't do it alone a relationship with Christ is with Christ it's not by yourself so get in a quiet time start spending time with God and allow God to pour into your life living water Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray right now for this youth group. I, I pray that, that we wouldn't be silent about the things of you, God, that the things that you want us to be passionate about, the things that you want us to talk about, but that, God, that we would begin to follow hard after you in the way that we live and the way that we talk and the things that we listen to. God, I, I pray that we would really just try to be a holy and set-apart people so that we can really just live and be in your light so that people will see us and not necessarily be attracted to us, but be attracted to you. Lord, I pray that on each person here, and I thank you for the decisions made today. It's all up to you. In your name we pray. Amen. We all finished. Stay seated. Stay seated. All right, guys. Do we got any announcements before we go? Let me think. Let me think. Okay. The one is, guys... There is no Thursday next week. So I already said it earlier. So we're going to be on vacation, so you're not going to have any drivers. So that's the biggest reason why, unless you guys all have cars, and you guys are more than welcome to do something Thursday without us. But we won't be there because we'll be on vacay. But we'll be back this Friday. So I want to see you guys here this Friday. We will be here. We're going to have an awesome night. It's going to be a lot of fun. And keep me in your prayer prayers, guys, because I literally have a baby coming next week. And so it could be it could be any time. It could be tonight, it could be tomorrow. But if it doesn't happen, we'll probably be uh, at South Miami. Hey guys, listen up to this is another thing. I know a lot of you guys are going to want to visit and, and I know that you probably want to come by and you can talk to Ali about that later, but just know that it's really tough the first couple like days. And so we don't really need a lot of people there at first. Because she's going to be like, you know, torn apart because a baby's going to come out of her. It's a really crazy experience. And so I think she's going to want some space. But, you know, and my hand will probably get crushed. So pray for my hand. So, I, you know, I don't break it. I have broken my hand before on Thomas's head a long time ago. <laughs> Another story when I was 15. All right. But, yeah, definitely keep it in prayers. Also, guys, did we get, hey, Thomas, did we get pizza? 
We have pizza, awesome. Well, guys, with that being said, pick up your chairs, please, and go get some pizza.